Hi everyone, I'm Amber Masso. I am the Director of Communications and Alumni Engagement for the Terry Foundation. I'm joined today by Daphne Nawaz, one of our amazing Terry alumni, and I'll allow her to introduce herself and um, we're excited to bring this Terry and 30 chat to you today. Uh, hi everyone, uh, Amber, like Amber said, my name is Daphne Nawaz and I am a 1999 a Terry Scholar recipient from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I graduated in 2003 and I went to law school at the University of Houston, uh, graduating in 06. Um, and currently what I do uh, for my profession is I'm an assistant United States attorney uh, for the Western District of Texas and I work out of the San Antonio office. All right, great. So we've, you know, we're, we've got a brief 30 minute chat we're going to have today. Daphne, what do you hope that Terry scholars will be able to gather from our conversation we have today? Well, I hope that um, everybody maybe can learn a little bit about um, what a prosecutor is, um, what a prosecutor does. Um, maybe my chat um, makes some people decide that that sounds like an exciting, wonderful thing they might want to do with their lives. Um, but even if they don't, I hope that everybody um, can kind of take away from it that um, I think that it's okay to be searching for the thing that um, makes you happy and that, that it's okay that that search might not be exactly what you thought it was going to be. And I think it's okay if you're still searching. And, you know, I, I actually think it's good um, to continue searching and making sure that at all times you feel fulfilled and happy. All right, great. Well, I look forward to our chat today and we look forward to sharing it with all of you. Cool, okay, well, um, I'd love for us to just um, jump right in there and um, I'm a little embarrassed to say that I, I am one of those people that if my life depended on it and you asked me right now, what is a prosecutor and what does a prosecutor truly do? I mm -hmm. couldn't answer that. I couldn't answer that question. So, um, I would love to know just in general, like, what does your life look like for you right now? What do you, what do you mm -hmm. do? Sure. So, um, well, I guess the first thing I would say is that, um, actually, in the Texas rules of, of ethics, um, you know, the bar rules that I have to follow because I'm a prosecutor, um, it says that a prosecutor's job is to see that justice is done and not just to be an advocate. Um, so I kind of like to think that that is what I do for a living is I try to make sure that the just thing or the right thing gets done um, in, in what I'm doing. Um, so, but technically, so right now I'm a federal prosecutor, um, an assistant United States attorney. And so what I do is I prosecute violations of crimes, uh, of federal statutes that individual people or even organizations might commit. Um, and so I'm responsible on the federal side for working with certain agencies, uh, like the Federal Bureau of Investigation, for example, um, to investigate the crimes that may be being committed. And then assuming that um, I would have probable cause to believe a crime is committed and, and you know, believe that, uh, the next step would be bringing those charges in front of a grand jury. Um, and then basically handling the case uh, through uh, the, the, the process where it is actually in a court, um, going to trial on the case, if that is what the individual person would choose to do, um, and handling it all the way through to conclusion. Um, I used to be a state prosecutor, and the job was similar on the state side. It's just that you, you handle state crimes as opposed to federal crimes. So is there is there like an easy way to explain what the difference might be between two of those? Like what sure. what gets something to your level? So and it 
They are very similar and there are many crimes that are both state crimes and federal crimes. So they can actually, you can have the same conduct, but it could be a violation of, of both state law and federal law. Um, generally, the, the one big difference is um, it's, it's basically, sometimes there's an interstate connection. There's criminal conduct that might occur between two different states. So that kind of means that there's what I would call a federal interest or that the United States government would take more of an interest in it. Um, in, in the realm of prosecution of uh, drug-related crimes, um, typically it would be large quantities of drugs, meaning kilogram quantities, and typically we go after organizations. So like, for example, the cartels in Mexico, um, you know, we, there's not really any sort of prosecution of generally, or at least not a big focus on mere possession. It's more targeting organizations and, and violence that's being committed by those organizations. Um, so there's a focus on that. So I would say probably the big difference is also on the federal side, there's a lot of investigation that goes into cases. Um, whereas on the state side, you may just get someone who's already been charged and you have to sort of deal with that. Okay. So thank you for clearing that up for me, first of all. Um, <laughs> sure. I'm sure there's probably other people that were curious as well. Um, I'm also curious um, what, like, what motivates you to do this work? Like what is, what has led you to have the goals that you've had and to, um, to take on this charge of upholding justice and in this particular way? And, and I, I will say that it is definitely, it's, it's not something that I did straight out of law school. Um, it, it was definitely a journey uh, to get there. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. So first of all, I guess what drew me to law school or to law in the first place, um, well, I, I would say my, my, my husband probably had some, some, uh, some say in that, you know, he was kind of telling me, you know, Daphne, you can't stay in school and get your PhD and be there forever because, you know, you will have no money and <laughs> we, we will be poor forever, you know. Um, and I think he said it as a joke, but I mean, I, re <laughs> I remember he was, he says he's joking. He's like, I didn't mean that, you know, but it, I was like, no, that, you know, that, that actually makes some sense, you know, so I was trying to decide between, you know, law school or, you know, what I wanted to do if I, I was going to pursue a PhD in government, um, but it, I, I was very heavily involved throughout high school and college in public speaking, um, speech and debate. I was on the speech team at the University of Texas, um, and so I did that during my undergraduate years, and um, I mean, it, it was... I loved it. I loved being able to compete and to speak to people, and um, I thought that, that that was kind of a decider, you know, well, I can do that if I study law. It's kind of, you know, and then I got to law school and I kind of forgot about it a little bit. I mean, I did, in, in, in law school, there's things like moot court and mock trial where you're, you are doing kind of fake trials, you know, so you are doing it. Um, but I ended up actually taking a job at a law school in civil litigation at a firm. Um, and I, I think the reason I did that is because that's just sort of what everybody does. It's this kind of law school culture. It makes you think that you have to do it. Um, you Going know, to a firm and, or? Yeah, I mean, working, kind of working in a civil firm, a bigger firm. Um, there's, you know, they have these career fairs in law school where employers come and they, you know, um, interview students for jobs and everything. And I, I mean, my experience, and I think the experience of most people is that there's not a focus on government jobs or nonprofits or activities sort of 
in those sectors, there's a very big focus at these job fairs on big firms. Um, and, you know, you, you you do it because you know you 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 know you think you are oh, you know I do want to practice litigation you know I mean civil law maybe is not quite the most exciting and I and I have to say I had a good experience I had a mid-sized firm that I worked at for a couple of years and I just wasn't fulfilled um, I mean that they were the people I was working with were nice. I had great partners. They let me do depositions. They let me, and you know, being one or two years out, it was a big deal. I mean, I, I mean, they were giving me as much as they could. It's just, we never went to trial. Um, and that's just sort of, it's something you don't, I don't know, you don't understand that practicing that type of law and doing that type of thing, like you're not gonna be in the courtroom. And nobody really tells you that, you know? And I found that I, you know, I wasn't, you know, I was writing a lot of memos a lot of times, you know, I wasn't writing, you know, and that would go to a partner and then the partner would prepare, you know? Right. And I just, it wasn't for, you know, I wanted to be out there. I wanted to be in trial. Um, and so that is how I ended up making the switch because I knew if I, I so I went to work at the Harris County D district attorney's office. Um, I took a big pay cut. Um, and I was in trial probably the first week. Um, but, and it, it, I didn't really realize at the time I left, um, I think what I realize now is the most fulfilling part of my job. Um, I left because I wanted to get trials and I wanted to be in the courtroom. Um, and I got that, you know, but what, what I, and I, and since that time, so I've been a prosecutor since 2008. So, um, like almost 12 years now. And I mean, it probably took me because you start in misdemeanors when you first start. So you were handling very, very minor crimes, but first time I handled, um, aggravated assaults with domestic violence, where I was actually having victims and women um, that needed my help, you know, um, talking to them one-on-one -on -one and realizing that I could help them if I just sort of stayed the course and, you know, um, prosecuted the person that hurt them. And I, you know, I, I had a lot, I remember vividly having a lot of women who like hugged me and thanked me. And I, I just, I realized that I was, um, doing something that was helping people. And that feeling hasn't gone away. Um, so that's, that turned out to be what I love about my job. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time, but. So that's when it clicked for you. Um, I wanna go back to the point where you were somewhere that you said you had a pretty good situation. Everyone was nice. Um, it sounded like you were making a pretty decent living or at least one that you had a noticeable pay cut when you moved to something else. So how right. did you know, how did you know it was time to make the move then? I mean, you knew that you weren't fulfilled. So was there a, was there a particular moment or something for you that made you say, you know what, I'm not happy and I need, like, I need a change. And this is, this is the moment where I'm going to go ahead and make that change. Was there, was there a singular moment like that for you or how did that come about? It, you know, it, I'll say this, it was really hard for me to make the change. And I think it was because for all intents and purposes, I had a really good situation. You know, a lot of my friends who were at different firms, um, it, were literally crying with how much they hated it, you know, and oh, I've got this mean partner and whatever. And for me, you know, the, the people I was working with were so nice and helpful. They were giving me as much as they could of, of you know, stuff to, to, to get in there. And I remember just thinking, I'm actually like comparatively, right, got it really good. You know, I should just stick with this. I should like persevere, you know. Right. Um, I think there's something about being, you know, being a Terry scholar or, you know, people who, who 
have sort of, you know, achieved, you know, in the past, it's, it's, you feel almost like if you give up that you're Mm. failing or that you're a failure, you know what I mean? It's hard. It was hard mentally to, to, to process that and to realize that, no, you know, it's, it's not giving up. I'm not a failure. I, I am making this choice for myself. And I, when I started thinking about it and I realized that every day I was sort of sitting there thinking, you know, how could I do it? Could I do it? And I just kept thinking about it. And I thought, you know, if I'm thinking about it, that means I'm not happy. Like if right. that, you're sitting there and considering it, that means that you're not truly happy. And mm-hmm. so if that's the case, each day, you know, I thought to myself, each day that I wait, that's one less day when I'm not doing the thing that even though I wasn't exactly a hundred percent sure what that was, I, I right. knew that what I was doing wasn't quite it, you know? Mm. Um, so no, I, I wasn't an exact moment, but it definitely was sort of uh, repeated thinkings of it. Oh, you know, right. and then start, and then when I sat down and I tried to sort of plan out, like, could I do this? You know, mm-hmm. As soon as I got to that, that point and I started being like, okay, how can we do? Okay. It was, it was done. Um, so it sounds more like it was just an increasing awareness and, and almost having to separate the difference between I'm in what you would consider a good situation versus I'm in a situation that is not completely good for me. It's not a fit for me. Um, but yeah, it sounds like, uh, just becoming more mindful of the fact that you're consistently thinking about something other than what you're currently doing. So did mm-hmm. did you, and this is, this is something that um, I know I've experienced personally, but I've talked to other people who felt this way too, when they've made a shift, was there any guilt? Did you feel any, any guilt for stepping away from something that you, that you shouldn't have been unhappy about or I mean I just I feel like I hear from that from people a lot I did I I mean I I think and and on multiple levels so because I I had made like I would consider the the two kind of name partners at my firm that that where I was like how am I gonna tell them that I'm you know yeah um I really respected them I thought they were amazing and I was I, I did, I, I felt guilty leading up to it and then guilty after because I didn't want to let them down. Mm. Um, but, and I remember being so shocked. They were very supportive of it, which, but they were supportive in the way of like, no, because they, one of them had been a former assistant DA in mm. Harris County. So he understood, um, and he, you know, was like, yeah, go get a whole bunch of trials and then come back. You know, you know? <laughs> um, what he said. I, and um, no, but I did. I felt, I felt like I was letting them down. And then I was kind of worried that I was also letting my husband down a little bit, just maybe monetarily as I was kind of worried, you know, about that. But, mm. you know, honestly, I, I thought to myself, I'm, 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 I'm young. I don't have kids at this point. And we can, we talked about it, you know, I'm like, this is, isn't this the time? I mean, if I'm going to do it, I this is when to do it, you know? Right. Like, particularly if you feel like something that you were passionate about or something that you had a strength for, especially having done, you know, debate and other things before finding out if that was really something that you wanted or if it was mm-hmm. something you just still needed to explore. So, right. um, I mean, so it sounds like though you found that satisfaction pretty quickly or you had that confirmed for you. So what is, um, so what did that journey look like then making it from where you started with the DA to, you know, what you're doing now? How did you decide that the federal level is where you (laughs) wanted to go? So you, you got to the trial stage, which is what you wanted, but how did you, how did you then decide it's time to make another move? Like, what did that, what did that look like for you? Yeah. And, and the move, so my husband, um, was also an assistant district attorney, um, in Harris County. And, and so actually we had to have that conversation. It was like, you know, 
I, I remember promising him, don't worry, I'm not going to bother you at work. There are <laughs> many doors to the building, you know, you won't uh -huh. see me. Um, and it's funny because it, he wouldn't say it, but I, I know he was kind of like, eh, we're going to work together. And then, right. and we've, we literally up until the last couple of years have worked together for, I mean, over a decade. Um, uh -huh. So he, so I, without getting too much into it, the, the Harris County DA's office during the time we left had undergone sort of some high level management changes. Um, mm -hmm. And we were, along with a lot of other um, career prosecutors, were just really unhappy with how the office was sort of being run, you know? Right. So honestly, I had been, you know, I, we, we both knew like, we're going to be prosecutors. Like, we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're not, we're not changing fields. We're not, we know this is what we want to do. And so, uh -huh they we i randomly found um uh you know a posting where they were hiring for not just one assistant u.s attorney but multiple mm -hmm. and i mean we kind of applied on a whim we didn't think they'd hire us both you know, right. you know? but uh they they did I, um i and uh you know i i think it for for me was um I don't know. It was, it's the best thing I've ever done. Um, and for me, the, 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 the reason that I enjoy being a federal prosecutor so much, um, I kind of, I think mentioned it before, but I, mean, I literally get to investigate, um, things from before they become anything. So mm -hmm. I can be involved literally from the ground up and I have the ability to, you know, decide, you know, maybe you know, the, the, this is not worthy of federal prosecution or, you know, this, this, this. So mm -hmm. I have kind of more options um, to make sure that I feel like I'm doing the right thing. Right. So just constantly being able to assess and reassess your situation and mm -hmm. the, the fulfillment and the challenges you're getting from the work. Um, mm -hmm. I, I definitely appreciate you sharing sort of that inner conflict you had early on making that move for yourself um especially when you have either internal or external or both um mm -hmm. forces telling you why would you like what's wrong with what's wrong with what you're doing now or why would you know why would you make a change or why aren't you satisfied mm -hmm. um and i think that uh that goes beyond just, um, you know, people in the legal field, but really being able to pay attention to, am I, am I feeling challenged? Am I feeling fulfilled? Or am I doing what other people are telling me is suited, is suited for me? Right. So now that you're doing what, what you set out to do, do you, do you still find challenges, um, you know, what are, what are some common challenges that you still feel like you have to overcome, um, mm -hmm. in your, just in your daily work? So, um, you know, a, a lot of my challenges sometimes focus on, um, some of it is sort of mundane, but, um, <laughs> um, dealing with agencies, um, you know, Sometimes if you have um, investigations that involve multiple agencies, you know, there may be uh, FBI, there might be Homeland Security, there might be IRS, you know, a lot of times the agencies um, may have conflicts, you have to kind of resolve those. <laughs> mm. So kind of playing sort of the uh, moderator to a certain degree, that's yeah. like, um, that's a, a common challenge. And, you know, I, I, I think that, um, but they're fun challenges, you know, I mean, you know, obviously you spend a lot of your time dealing with opposing counsel. Um, and so, you know, forging relationships with individuals, even, um, though you're on different sides, you know, working through things like that, um, which is, which is kind of fun. Um, those are sort of some of my day to day kind of activities. Um, that I would say I do probably every single day, um, which I'm sure everybody does is also like responding to like a billion emails, right? <laughs> so like, <laughs> up, you know, um, so I'm sure every single person has to do that. Um, but no, yeah, those so, are, those are some of my day to days. So 
based on the kind of career that you have and the fact that there, there are definitely media portrayals of the kind of work do you do, what do you, right. what do you think about like the average interpretation people might get like of what they see on TV or in movies or in the news versus what, what the actual work looks like? I, to me, I think that, um, I think there's a couple things. So a lot of times what you might see in the newspaper, or what you might read about or see, I think a lot of times focuses on um, prosecutors who have done something wrong. Mm. And I, 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 just from my experience, obviously everybody I work with, they're good people. They're people just like everybody else. And I think that they are trying to, to, they got into the job because they want to help people. I think most people who get into s things like public service or th even working in nonprofits and things like that mm -hmm. have an overwhelming desire to want to try to help in some way, shape or form. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I think a lot of people too feel that prosecutors prosecute trivial things or things that people think shouldn't be crimes, you know, for example, like, you know, I don't know, possession of marijuana is a big one. It's already been legalized in a ton of states. Um, and I think that there are prosecutors probably like that, that might have to sit there and be like, am I really going to have to prosecute this possession of marijuana case? You know, right. um, luckily that's not something I have to sort of experience at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it's, um, it's tough. I, I think those things are tough. I think those people don't necessarily want to be doing that. Right. But right. you know what I mean? I mean, these are all people who may have their own personal views on why laws need to be different or why laws need to be changed. Mm -hmm. But their job is, well, their job is to seek justice, you know, but everybody has a boss. Right. Right. So when you mentioned, um, you know, people getting, getting into law because they want to help people, they want to make an impact. How do you keep that reminder fresh for yourself, especially when you're in the middle of like those billion emails or some of the minutia of uh, the cases you're working on or like a day you're having to play referee between a couple of like agencies? How do you keep that? How do you keep that sense of fulfillment and that sense of motivation fresh? Um, I think that it's very challenging. Um, I have, obviously, we've been teleworking for a really long time because of the lovely COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm in my office, I actually have um, a lot of stuff sort of around my desk, um, sort of like I have a big kind of thing that talks about justice, you know, so if I'm sort of in the, you know, I can kind of glance over, I don't know, it, I try to fill my office with things that Visual remind cues. Mm -hmm. that remind me of sort of what my overall goal is, you know, um, yeah. and things like that. Um, I've, I've found it really important to also find like form of stress relief. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> just cause you know, I mean, it's, it's hard and that's for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, um, it, you know, try, try to like at least get some walking in or something every day when I'm really tired mm. just so I can like you know let go right okay. create a little bit of distance between yourself and but so it's interesting that you were talking about um COVID that was actually going to be my next question <laughs> what does that look like for a prosecutor and for the kind of work you do mm -hmm. during, during the pandemic I mean are you in the courtroom at all or is... no, at least no not not um right now it it has been this one of the strangest things that I've dealt with in my professional life. Um, we are doing um, most of our, well, actually all of our court, a lot of it has been rescheduled due to the pandemic, but we still have plenty of people, you know, people need to enter pleas, they need to be sentenced, um, you know, different matters that, that come before the court and we're doing it via Zoom. And, it's so odd seeing people's houses and, you know, um, just seeing the judge. Some The judges are, in, in my situation, a lot of, they're in the courtrooms, but um, uh -huh. odd. Um, so they're like and, on Zoom, but they're still in the robes and they're like seated yeah. where they would be seated. Yeah. We're, while all the attorneys are sort of in their, in their house, you know, right. but people haven't showed up in, in nightgowns or anything. So uh -huh. I think. 
I bet you there are way less people actually wearing shoes and like professional, like professional bottoms. I bet so. Because how would you know? <laughs> you know and so uh, there's one judge who's, he's, a, he's really funny. And I remember right at the beginning of when all of the, all of the stuff started, you know, he, um, he made a joke and he said, okay, first order of business, everybody stand up, take your computer and, and, and put it down so I can see what you're wearing, you know, and then <laughs> he saw like a look of terror on people's faces. And then he was like, I'm just kidding. I know you guys are all in your like Bermuda shorts, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So have you ever been in a situation where like somebody's kid or somebody's cat or something like interrupted? A <laughs> I mean, I, I, mean, I might have had like important one, like proceedings since. I mean, in front of that same judge, actually, um, thank God, because he has the best sense of humor. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, one of my cats might've broken through the door of my bedroom and hopped up on my desk, like while I was arguing emotion. So, you know, I was like in the middle of like my best point and she jumps up here and I just remember just sort of smooching her down. And I remember the judge was, Miss A, what is that? Was that a cat? I bring the cat back up. Let us all see. You know, I mean, he was just having a good old time. Um, the whole, I, I was petrified, you know? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, there was this, I'll tell you one more real quick. There was a defense attorney who was, you know, she was on the screen and all of a sudden a bird flew in her, and I'm like, why do you have your windows open? But a bird flew in her open window and like flew past her face. And she, she was like, she's doing this. And she's like, we, we have got a bird in my house. And like, hang on. And she, you know, she like muted and saw her running around. And then she comes back. She's like, uh, the, the bird is out of my, I, I, she burned out of my room. <laughs> uh, that, that, that judge didn't make, made no comment. Just pretended like it didn't happen. <laughs> but do you feel like whenever things go back to like normal or whatever normal is supposed to look like that like you all have a different view of like your colleagues or people that you work with that maybe um doesn't lend itself to the same atmosphere you might have had in the courtroom before because like mm -hmm. I actually think it's been really beneficial um and helpful in that regard because it I think it reminds you that all of these people who might be say opposing how they they're just people like you that, you know, have <laughs> kids and animals and, you know, random birds flying through wildlife windows. flying into their house. <laughs> um, and, you know, it also kind of reminds you that everybody's in a shared situation with the same difficulties that you mm -hmm. are experiencing. And so I, I hope, or I think that it's going to make everybody sort of, I don't know, come together even a little bit more. Right. I, do, I think you make a good point, though, that reminder about the human element that, that there is another human being on the side of things. So, And that is oftentimes in the legal profession overall, something that I think a lot of people, it's so easy to forget. Mm -hmm. Any parting words of wisdom for, for any Terry's just from you and your personal experiences? Um, I think that I would suggest that, well, first of all, this coming from what I know about Terry scholars um, is that they are all very smart, accomplished, kind of go-getter type people, right? I think it's important to remember that you're always going to have those characteristics about yourself. Um, and so based kind of on that, I, I would say my piece of advice would be that if you are feeling that say maybe your profession or even other things in your life, if they're not fulfilling you, I think that you should go for it. You know, find something that you really like. And I think that because of your foundation as a scholar and because of those attributes you already have, if it doesn't work out, I think that you could always find, still keep searching and find that thing that really fulfills you. Um, and so, I think that would be my advice. Sure. Well, I think that your story kind of illustrates that really well. It's just 
keeping your eyes open and being mindful of that level of fulfillment you are or are not getting because you might, again, you might be in a situation that people say is a good situation or you believe should be good enough for you, mm-hmm. but there can, it's still possible for something to be missing. And there's nothing wrong with saying it's not enough for me. I can right. do better for myself. And only you know you. I mean, you you know, we all tend to listen to to people. I mean, it's just natural, right? Um, but at the end of the day, you know, what's in your gut and what you are telling yourself is 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 what I think what matters. I mean, obviously you're you're taking input from all these sources, but you've got to do you, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's true. No one knows, no one knows you better than you know yourself and what, right. and what you are and are not receiving in terms of fulfillment, in terms of, you know, satisfaction and happiness with, with what you're doing. So, well, I appreciate you um, sharing your story. Um, I would never turn down the ability to hear more um, Zoom courtroom stories for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so yeah, thanks for, thanks for giving us a Terry and 30 chat. Really appreciate it. Sure.